Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Fullest Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Bostwick, and today's guest is Carson Meyer, who's a certified birth doula, birth photographer, and the founder of See in the Moon. In 2016, Carson graduated from NYU, where she pursued studies in child development, art therapy, and alternative medicine. Carson then returned to her home in Malibu and began her journey as a doula supporting parents through a healthy and peaceful pregnancy, birth, and postpartum period. With a passion for environmental health, Carson also launched Sea in the Moon, which is an all-natural and sustainable skincare line founded on the belief that the way we care for ourselves has a direct impact on how we care for the planet. I... 100% agree with you on that statement, Carson. Like I, I think about this all the time, how, what, you know, it goes down to everything from what we put on our skin to what we ingest. And, um, you know, that includes even a lot of chemicals that we put in, in like pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. Not that, you know, that obviously I understand that people need that in certain times in their lives. And, it's wonderful that we have Western medicine, but I think about that a lot because as we know, like our water and so much is polluted with all these chemicals. And if we could just remember that what we use on ourselves, like whatever's good for the environment should also be good for us, you know? And I think we forget that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we have really forgotten that our body is an amazing detox machine if we give it the opportunity to do so. Um, Yeah. And that we can't really buy our way into, into health, right. It has to, it has to start with our environment. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This has been like a long time coming and I just really look up to you and I love just how many different things that you're up to and you've always done. And it, it takes a lot to have a company. It takes a lot to support moms. And also I know you're an actress, whether you're acting right now or not, it's irrelevant. It's just like, you've done a lot and you've studied a lot. And I'm always inspired by how passionate you are about everything you're doing. So I excited for our conversation. Thank you. The feeling is so mutual. I had no idea you're a birth photographer as well. Yeah, I studied photography in in high school. And so it's always like a a passion of mine. But um, I found when I became a doula that I, I, that was my job, right? To just like take the pictures on the iPhone or, you know, dad would pass me the camera and be like, will you take some photos? And the iPhone photos are never as good as photos on a, on a real camera. And, um, I also really saw that for, for a lot of moms, it was very healing to see from a different perspective, what their body just did. Yeah. Um, and I think it helped to reframe the healing process after birth and have this like even deeper gratitude and respect for their body. And so I started including it in my doula package, um, so I'm already there in the space, you know, something I was already doing and I love it. I think I always say it's, it's really easy to pretend to be a photographer when you're a, a birth photographer, because yeah. every, every moment is so special that even though there's definitely some birth photographers out there who have, um, a lot more skills, um, as photographers and, um, you know, just around lighting and editing and all of that. I'm like, it, it's because you're capturing such a magical moment. It's, it feels like an easy, an easy. No, that makes sense. I love that. So, okay. You went to NYU, you studied art therapy, alternative medicine, child development, which is so cool that they offer um, that opportunity at the school to kind of create your own program. I'm so curious how you got into becoming a doula. Like, was that the, a direct result of what you studied or was that kind of random? You know, it's funny. I don't think I even knew what a doula was when I started college. I definitely didn't set out with my studies thinking I would have this job. Um, I was on my own healing journey. And so I was very interested in 
complementary medicine and health and women's health. And I was acting and my acting teacher here in LA was really adamant about me not going to Tisch at NYU and studying acting, but rather just doing the things that interest me and kind of becoming a more well-rounded person in my educational journey. Um, and so I didn't study acting at NYU, but I, I wanted to study the connection between creativity and self-expression and how that was used in a healing, healing modalities, which is where the art therapy part came in. I also have just always been all over the place with my interests. So going to Gallatin was a blessing because I don't think I could fit into a, a major, but anyway, I yeah. saw, um, the business of being born in one of my classes. I think that was assigned in in one of my classes. And I was, so I was probably halfway, maybe a little bit more through college at the time. And I think that's the first time I I heard the term doula. Um, the first time birth was like anything I even thought about. Um, and it wasn't until I graduated though, and moved home and met a midwife that I realized that you could really have a career or a job in the space and, and saw how passionate I was about it. But I do think looking back, it's funny. My major kind of is, is had I known I'd wanted to be a doula, there's things I would have done differently, but I do think my major is very similar to what I study now. And I think very few people can say that about college. Yeah, I know. That's why I was like, wow, it's kind of on (laughs) point. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it is, and which is which is awesome. But it definitely took took a while to to land. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, like your, you know, I'm sure like your upbringing had a lot to do with your interest in acting. But is I I mean, I've only met your mom once, but from what I remember, she seems like she's super into alternative medicine as well. Do you think that's why? you were into it? Like what was your healing journey like or about like, what, how did you get into that? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, it's funny. My mom was the one who suggested I go to an acting class when I was in college. Cause she saw me start to kind of have spark an interest in that. And I was so glad that I went to the acting class that I went to. Cause I, I grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up in, um, kind of Hollywood family and knew very little about the craft of acting. I, I understood the business side more, just not understood, but was more familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I never thought it was something I wanted to be a part of. Um, and then I went to this acting class at the Ruskin school theater and funny enough, it was the teacher is somebody my mom went to college with. So someone she knew forever and he just it's such a unique approach to acting he uh, teaches Meisner John Ruskin and it wasn't we didn't even start looking at scenes or memorizing lines I don't think until like six months into the course wow. so it was all about the self and so it was about kind of like just digging deep and exploring your own just landscape of our emotions and um human connection and just how we communicate with one another, how we, um, how we, how we use this kind of cathartic tool, um, as a way to bring us closer to ourselves and one another. And so that was the first time I, it kind of felt like group therapy (laughs) more than an acting class. And that was the first time that I like the word, like mind body connection and, I don't know. Like I I was very spiritual, that experience. And so for me, that was really, it's funny. I like was introduced to the craft of acting and the beauty of that side of, of the the job that I wasn't exposed to in such a profound way. And I think that ultimately launched me on my, my doula journey, but my mom, um, you know, I feel very fortunate. She was an environmentalist. And so she way ahead of the time, way ahead of the curve in terms of, um, clean beauty and non-toxic ingredients. I mean, she always warned me of chemicals and cleaning products and didn't let me paint my nails (laughs) as a young girl. Yeah. So I don't know about like complimentary medicine and my mom, but she really was, she's always been very, um, 
you know, conscious about pesticides. And because of her activism work environmentally, she had access to a lot of information that um, I think just now is starting to come to the surface. And so she 100% shaped my views on just personal health and environmental health. That's so cool. Not many people can say that. I think I, I usually it's like our generation that's waking up their parents and um, I think it's super cool. Obviously you're taking that to the next level with launching a brand that's bringing that to the forefront. So that's really cool. Yeah. But I'm interested in, so you were doing the doula work and you still are, and that's a main part of what you do, but also seeing the moon is, you know, everywhere. And I, I love it so much. And that's also a big part of what you do. So I'm curious how that came into play and then also just like how you balance both. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you guys have been the earliest, first, greatest supporters of seeing the moon literally from day one. Aww. The first when you guys were selling other products yeah. to sell it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's been that really, like I said, my mom was always very hesitant about me using um, makeup and products that my friends were using. And so we made a lot of products at home. And so we'd make lotions and scrubs and, um, the body scrub was something that I literally just was making for as long as I can remember. I took things from the pantry. So it was brown sugar, coconut oil, almond, jojoba, and castor oil, and then put a uh, vanilla extract in it. And so that was something I made for myself. It was my go-to gift. It was kind of this like this product that all my friends and family knew about and loved. And I never thought it would be a career. Um, until my little brother actually, he when he went off to college, so I, I moved to New York. The scrub got me through my first winter as a California girl. Yeah. Like I, I could not believe what it did to my skin, um, the New York cold. And so the scrub was a savior for me. And then I noticed that because I had moved and the scrub wasn't just like around anymore, I had all these people calling me saying like they needed shipments of the scrub. And so I was shipping it back to LA and funny enough for my dad and my brother, who are these two like very macho guys, but like couldn't live without this body scrub. And when my brother went to USC he brought a mason jar of it and he found that it kept getting stolen out of his dorm room and he would find it in the shower. And so all the other boys in his dorm were using the scrub. And so he called me one day and he's like, I think, I don't know, I think you might be onto something. Like even the guys at, at my school, these frat boys are stealing the scrub and love it. Why don't you try and like make a batch and sell it on Instagram. And so I did that for a little bit and it went well. I mean, people really liked it, but I was making it in my kitchen, had no structure and infrastructure set up. Um, and then about two years ago with the help of a mentor and investor who has kind of really just helped guide me through the whole process and, um, take it to the next level. I launched seeing the moon. And so now it's no longer made in my kitchen. Um, but it's the same, same ingredients, same formula and same love. That's amazing. I love that story. And I mean, I knew that it obviously came from your heart and something that you used personally, but, but to take it to the next level is a huge step. And I think that's awesome that you have a mentor and someone who really helped guide you, but it still is there's so many things you need to do. And it's so funny because when we ordered it at the fullest at the time we were doing our own fulfillment and like, I noticed that it came from a 3PL and I was like, that's so awesome because we were kind of exploring having a third party shipper. And I think, you know, when brands are really small and they're launching, it's really hard to figure out how to take it to the next level. And it was just really cool to see that, you know, you kind of like had, it just seemed to me like you had your ducks in a row and you're launching in glass. Everything's really like clean and environmentally friendly. And you're also able to, you know, fulfill and make it in a way that is sustainable for growth. Right. I mean, I don't know if you do your own fulfillment now. Obviously, no. and, and I, I love that you kind of caught that because I, I'm such a do it all. And I know you're like this too. You're so grassroots and so passionate and like 
you treat your business like a child. And I think when we have that love for what we do, it's really hard to allocate. Like yeah. that's the hardest part. And I would still be making it in my kitchen and packing each one and writing like a note. Like that's just what I want it to be. Yeah, but yeah. Winter was like, you have to like, you can't make it yourself anymore. And it's true. I started yeah. resenting it. Like every order was like stress because totally. you can't grow. And then with the fulfillment too, which I, I mean, I know so many brands, small brands who do their own fulfillment and I have so much respect, but I early on let that go. And that made a huge difference, but there's still a lot of things. And I'm curious with you and in, in your business, what, what are the things for you? But like, I still answer all my customer service emails myself. Oh yeah, totally. And like I like, there's a lot of things that I'm like, I need to move past this, but I can't. Yeah. Like it's, you, you, we get in our own way. I think as when you're passionate. Yeah. I think like, also, um, I don't have like a business number still for the fullest. So <laughs> Me neither. We're like launching ads and Facebook was like, what's your business phone number? So customers can reach you. I'm like, no, this, I can't use my cell phone, but I have to get it in because I need a phone number. And no, me too. it's not good. But yeah, there are little things like that that are funny. But I, I just think it's so great that you had a mentor and someone who you know, really believed in you and was guiding you because I think everyone really needs that, especially in the beginning. And, and I, I wish there was like more access for that for people. And, and there is, it's just that, you know, you need to join groups and then it's like, what group is in alignment with, especially the type of product that you're creating, right? It's so niche, but also something that everyone can use. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's really interesting, but I love it so much. And and so I'm curious, like, how are you navigating being a doula and doing that? Because that's a lot of work. I mean, it's it's hard. I I definitely, but look, both jobs, I feel very fortunate. I can set my own schedule. Look, I can work on the weekends if I want to or not work on a Monday. And, um, you know, when, when a birth happens, then everything else kind of goes by the by the wayside. And I focus on the birth. And then I focus on my recovering from the birth. And then I get back to supporting my clients while they're not giving birth and doing my class and, and seeing the moon. I mean, it's, I think had, if I wasn't working as a doula, seeing the moon would be at a different place. Um, I have to admit that, like, I, I know that I'm not giving, I'm giving it all of me. Um, but it's hard, you know, like there's, Oh, sometimes like well, I'll have a three day birth and all of a sudden that's that week is, is no longer a week I can be focusing on my business. Yeah. Um, I'm also not a parent yet. And so I think any mother knows too, it's, there's a balance with everything. And I think there'll come a time when maybe that is when I have kids where I can't be a doula and a business owner and a mom, you know, right now I can be a doula and a business owner because I have other flexibilities in my life. Yeah. It's, it's a good balance though at the same time. Cause I feel like I'm doing, or I'm a mom and I have this and it's good to kind of like go away from your business and come back to it. Yeah. because Then you have a different perspective and you're not so like deep in it. I think some people get so deep in it that you can't see the overall picture maybe. Um, yeah. There are definitely like disadvantages to it, but there are advantages, I think, overall. But you've grown so much that so I'm curious, like, like what's next? I know you have a candle and a scrub. Like, are you, I think some people are like, no, this is our product and we want to get it to as many people as possible. And other people are, you know, their strategy is, no, we want to develop more products. And I'm always curious what people what their um, goal and strategy is. Yeah. So we're oil is next coming soon. And everybody who's, who knows me knows it's been like a year and a half of me saying that. Um, and that's what I mean, I guess, by just the, the pace is different when you have two careers and when it's, it's literally just me, I'm the only employee of the company. So it's, I'm working at a different pace. I also never really envisioned seeing the moon to be, I guess, scaling and growing at the same rate as what consumers expect and what our culture 
tells us profit. Um, Yes, I want to grow. Yes, I want to expand. And yes, I want to have a bunch of amazing products. And we're on, you know, we're we're growing and doing that. We as in me. Um, But I, um, I also I don't know, like I it, it's not about for me just producing, producing, producing to hit the next mark and make that profit. It's really about creating thoughtful products um, that are born out of necessity. And yes, I also think the scrub is our hero product. It's it's the purpose behind the brand. It's the inspiration behind the brand. And so I do love the idea of also growing the scrub um, as much as possible and just having it be growth that I can manage. Yeah, no, I love that because we are as consumers so used to the new stuff coming out and that's the opposite of the type of culture that you and I want to create because, and I think about this all the time because we're trying to um, become B Corp certified. So we're now a benefit corp, but we need the certification next. And, and you just kind of like look into the fact that uh, for us, like being a content focused website, we had a really small footprint. Now that we have products, it's going to change and it's changing a lot, but then we're, trying to tell people to consume less, but then we're still producing stuff. And it's, you know, people are producing. So obviously I believe if you're going to buy something, buy something that's better for you and for the environment, but at the same time, you're still creating more and that's more waste. And, and so there's just this, like, you know, this thought behind everything that we do that, do we need this? Is this necessary? And um, I think it's important to have that mindset when you have a hand. A hundred percent. And I, I'm one of those people that could get so in my own head and so in my own way being like, I'm just not going to have a brand because, you know, the, like we don't need any more products and there's enough products out there and there's enough in the landfill and there's enough junk. But my work has kind of been getting over that and being like, if you don't participate, the brands that you don't want to see on the shelf they're going to, they're going to, they're going to participate and they're going to lead. And ultimately, like, I think it's people like us who do have that consciousness and that perspective. We have to join. Like if you kind of like, that's, that's how we change things. Mm -hmm. People are always going to be buying stuff, right? Like we're not, that's not going anywhere. We're not going to be like growing our own saffron or everybody can, you know, make their own products all the time. And I think that there's real potential to create a conversation of change. And I think it's so exciting to see so many, yeah, like thoughtful brands competing with some of these companies who have caused a lot of harm. Yeah, no, I I think that's such a good point. Like they're going to take the shelf space. So we might as well be the ones taking it and competing with them. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny because I was listening. I love Zach Bush and I know that too. And, um, I had him on the podcast, but I love listening to all the podcasts that he's on. And he was on Lacey Phillips and he was saying to her, like, we, I really loved this takeaway. He was basically like, we're in this place because we decided that we want to outsource our lives and we'd rather just sit on the couch and watch Netflix. And we'd rather outsource everything from like growing stuff, from cooking to whatever it is that we can like outsource, we want to do as a culture. And he's like, we need to get back to our roots. And that's, what's going to change, you know, the use of pesticides and all these things, because we've chosen to allow these companies to have GMOs and to do that because it's just easier. And I'm thinking like, I don't want to outsource my life. Like I want to have my farm. And obviously COVID has like really made me have this vision of living on a farm and having animals. And my, yeah. uh, my children are going to grow up there and, and have this connection to the land. And obviously I still want that. But lately I've been also thinking about how important it is to also support the people that are already doing that. So like for Eric and I, we're in Corona Del Mar here in Newport Beach. And like, it's very similar to where you are. And so it's like urban, but also beachy. But we have these amazing 
people that we know that are growing food and you know we either know them from the farmers market or they're they're like centers here that we go and support their farm stands or i know the baker that i buy my bread from and i think that's another way to do it where it's more accessible and obviously in some way like if you can afford to buy amazing food which i wish it was accessible to everyone so in one hand it's like okay, if we can't all have that, because I'm not going to grow saffron, unfortunately, I, I dream about it, but I'm not <laughs> going to grow it. Um, then I can support the right people that are doing yeah. it. And, and so then we can all really support each other. I think that's really like the future that I envision and that you're probably envisioning too. Absolutely. And even in that like utopia of our utopia, it still takes a village. So it's not the one person who's the mother who's growing the saffron and, you know, making the blends and taking care of the children and teaching the children. It's like, that's impossible. And so even in that, I think like ideal view, there's still the same, I think that same kind of pressure placed on specifically women, but on, you know, on the individual, um, is unrealistic. And, like you said, the more that we kind of support each person in the beautiful role that they bring to this village or to a society, um, especially when they're doing it mindfully and with love and respect for the, for the planet, um, I do think that that's the realistic way of creating, recreating that culture. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to talk to you I, about being a doula and like how that's changed speaking of culture and our utopia that we want to be in, like how has being a doula changed during COVID? And also I'm sure it's different than like from the very beginning to now. I I mean, your work in that sense and in that type of work that you're doing has been so important. It's always been important, but I feel like it's even more important now to have that support. And I'm curious how the climate has changed. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been very interesting to watch the past year and how it changed. I, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, no doulas allowed in most hospitals. There was probably two or three hospitals in my area that I could name or just in L.A. Um, that allowed doulas the whole time. But um, for the most part, a lot of doulas turned virtual. I saw so many people turned to home birth, which I thought was, I think is very exciting. Yeah, uh, I read somewhere and I don't know if this is a true statistic. I, I literally read it on Instagram. So I don't know if this is true, but I saw that, um, there was a 500% increase in home birth. Whoa. This year. Um, that sounds about right to me just from what I'm reading and seeing and hearing and, and watching, but, um, you know, home birth is already, uh, such a small percentage of people give birth at home in this country already. So it's not that much of an increase, Yeah, um, but really exciting. I think the fear for women of not having doula support, their partner allowed in, um, having to give birth in a mask, the fear of being in a hospital when, you know, we know that's not the, the best place to be. can guarantee that the virus is, yeah. um, I think that really just opened a lot of people's mind to be like, Oh, this home birth thing might not be that bad of an idea after all. Like they might be onto something. That's so <laughs> interesting. So that's been really cool. Um, I also have to say that, you know, I started my class, a virtual 12 week, uh, birth prep class and mother circle in the, during this time, which I would never have done had this not be in this situation. Um, but I think it's been, I've seen such an increase in a willingness for both parents to want to learn as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Right. They're like, okay, if I can't have the support I want, if my mom can't be there, my sister, my doula, there's all these new regulations, things are happening. How can I be my best advocate? And so people are just so much more passionate than I've ever seen about learning their rights and learning um, just about having a healthy pregnancy and birth. And so the circle was kind of born from that and has been just such a beautiful gift for me. I I love it so much. And I hope for the mothers in it as well. And just bringing community, you know, talk about that village. I mean, this process was never, ever intended to be done in isolation ever. Um, 
and so that's been really, really, I think hard on a lot of parents and makes me sad. And I, I try and remind my clients that, you know, it's, it's assessing risk and benefit, you know, for each person just the whole time, but there's a lot that cannot, I'm seeing a lot of people neglect, you know, postpartum care, pelvic floor health, you know, just you name it from pregnancy to birth to postpartum because of, of wanting to stay distance. And I think that there is a lot that needs to be addressed in those very, very crucial developmental times for mom and baby that, um, if it's right for that person that they should explore seeking out in-person support. That's a big change. I noticed too. It's just, it's just not getting the support you need. Your class, it's a 12 week class that helps them if they need to advocate for themselves in the hospital, or it's like for all periods, all everyone. So I have home birth, uh, mom is giving birth at home and hospital in the class. Um, I even have some that are in the preconception stage. Um, I have second time moms. And so we go over everything, like what to expect, um, you know, questions to ask your doctor, creating the birth intentions. If you are giving birth in the hospital, um, you know, knowing how to best advocate for yourself, comfort measures in labor. We bring in the partner and kind of have them ask questions and, and talk about that. We talk about breastfeeding, postpartum care, um, nutrition, all of all of it. We go through the whole the whole thing. Wow. I love that. Yeah. And how has your practice changed? Like what was the percentage of, of home births versus hosti- hospital births that you had before and after? Definitely seeing more um, home birth now. And so I think, yeah, like I said, there's definitely been a shift. Um, Look, we've been in and out of the hospital this whole year. So we were out and then back in and then around Christmas, they took us out again. So I've been in the hospital. I have never been spent so little time in the hospital as a doula, um, but I have been doing virtual births, which are not the same. Um, Oh my gosh, how how does that work? They like are better than nothing. I say, you know, I think there's, especially in the, prenatal care and the prep work, there's a lot of potential for, you know, for supporting and preparing the parents as they go forth to birth. And then, um, I'm on zoom as needed. So, oh my gosh, I mean, I'm still able to be an advocate and to answer questions and to kind of support my clients verbally and emotionally in that way, but I can't give a massage. I can't do a double hip squeeze. I can't get them water. I can't, you know, do the aromatherapy. Like there's definitely, it's not the same. It's, we pivoted and been flexible. And I think, you know, it, it works better than nothing. <laughs> but but man, that's in yeah. the, so is that virtual doula work, like whether they're at a home birth or in the hospital or no, no. Home, birth, home birth is the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Home, home birth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just, it, the only reason one would really go virtual is if, um, you, you couldn't go in the hospital. And I do have some people reaching out in other states who uh, in their area are not allowing doulas. And so I'm working with people all over the country now, which is so cool. Oh my cool. gosh, that's um, so cool. Yeah, which I love. But yeah, I mean, I think I would always recommend to people to find an in-person doula first. And then if their hospital doesn't allow that, virtual is the next best thing. That's so interesting. And have you ever been in a situation where like the midwife couldn't make it? And it was like you. As no, it's, it's funny. I haven't. Every baby's come with a midwife or doctor nearby. I've definitely have some, had some very close calls. Um, the ones that have happened that have been the closest have actually funny enough been hospital births. So my first birth ever was like, mom was like pushing in the lobby. And then I actually had a client a few weeks ago who she was hospital birth where I couldn't go. Um, but I labored at home with her for a long time. And then she, and she was like amazing. I mean, I was, I did not think she was that far along cause she was so composed and like <laughs> really seemed like she was like maybe five centimeters, you know, just like taught, like talking through them. And I'm like, okay, yeah. Her water broke and she's like, I think I'm ready to go to the hospital. I'm like, okay, whatever you're ready, like, let's get you in the car. And then once you get there, we'll set up the Zoom. And so I gave her about an hour to get there because they were driving quite a, quite a ways to get to the hospital. And so I left, they left, and I texted them like 45 minutes after I left them. 
And I was like, Hey guys, like, did you make it there? Like, are you all set up? Like, let's pop. Here's the zoom link. And they sent me a picture of the baby. Oh (laughs) my God. I was like, Oh my gosh. So she had her baby like, I think 15 minutes after arriving or 10 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) I work with a lot of first time moms and first time can be long. You know, those, those babies are usually the second time. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm pregnant right now, and I'm like, you so are? serious? Yes. How did I not know that? I know. Well, I'm 18 oh weeks, God. and like, I'm literally huge. Like, I'm as big as I was when I was giving birth. Oh my gosh! Oh my god! How did I not know that? I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Oh, cool. He's gonna have a little baby. I know. I'm so excited. We're really excited, but uh, I've heard so many like second time mom stories that are oh, yeah. old. <laughs> I'm just, you know, curious how it's gonna go. But, but it's amazing that you can still support a family. I mean, because okay, virtually is definitely not the way I personally want that if I'm going to do I'm going to do my first home birth this time I did the hospital birth last time so, um, but like it's funny because my last doula like she went and uh, she like Eric was really hungry and like she got him a burger and I felt like she was really supporting him but it wasn't yeah. like, that I felt neglected like she was great but you know I guess virtually you could be like, okay, I'm going to order you DoorDash. Like, I don't know. Have you done that? <laughs> I mean, the thing, I haven't, but I could. But also the hospitals like, aren't, it, it's a mess. Like the food oh situation, I usually make my clients bring all the food because it's like a nightmare dealing with who can come in the hospital, who can come out. Yeah, I think. I hope that it um, gets better soon. I feel like, I feel like more people are hopeful now and, um, and yeah, it's interesting with the vaccine. I'm like, I still went to go see my OBGYN and I was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to actually do a home birth. And he was like, why? And I was like, well, I don't want to deal with masks and like, you know, everything that's going on in the hospital. And he's like, oh, July, you're going to be fine. The vaccine's going to be out and all this is going to be over. And I was like, there's no way it's already, no. like almost no. like people are no. not going to be over it within a few months. Like, no. Okay. Yeah. We've also been saying that since week one of lockdown, I know. <laughs> like, like laughing about remember when they were like, just do this for a couple weeks and then everything. Yeah. Back to normal. It's yeah. I think a lot of this is here to stay. Um, but I think that with this is also, there's a lot of, like I said, like I've seen a lot of really, promising change um even though it's a very dark time i think for women giving birth on so many levels and and in the the system as a whole um but i do think there's a lot of people being like this this isn't what i want and i'm gonna look deeper and i'm gonna find other options and i'm gonna become more informed and i think that's the, the best way to create change i think so too and i feel like that's happening as well i mean i'm not I feel like I'm seeing it in a different way. Obviously I'm not working. I mean, it's a big deal to go from saying I'm going to have a hospital birth to having a home birth because of this, this, because it's, I mean, I feel like I've been in this place for a really long time in this wellness space. And I still was like, I'm going to have a hospital birth, you know? And, and so I think it's really cool to see parents and women just really trust themselves and know that this is what our body was like made for like recreating and and not that everyone gets to have that experience but um but for the most part majority of people do and i think it's really cool to trust your intuition and and to choose that route um but it's really interesting like you know obviously you know the fullest has a lot of alternative content and um And we, you know, we really question a lot of things and I've seen so many people just like reach out and say, you know, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. I I didn't really think about this before and, and now I'm really looking into it. And, and I know a lot of people who are um, like nervous at the same time or in fear mode, whether it's because they're afraid of the virus and they want to get a vaccine as soon as possible, or they're afraid of other things like their freedoms being taken away. And, 
and I'm in so many mom groups now about this. And I was like telling them actually, like recently I was just in one last night texting. I was like, there's fear on both sides. Like, and I think that's just this place that we don't want to be. And that's not a place of growth. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I love what you're saying. Like, I think what makes change is this opportunity to like really look within and see what you really want. And instead of coming from a place of fear. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I say about, you know, when, when this all started and there was really a home birth frenzy, like everybody, people who ended up staying in the hospital and I mean, midwives were getting, I feel like a hundred calls a day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, did I do this? Like everyone was freaking out. Um, and I did a few Instagram lives with like different midwives. I did one with Cindy Crawford. I did one with just different friends. I remember and that. Yeah. Home births. And my intention with that was to really, A, I think just so many people don't even know what home birth entails and what, and what it really is, but also just honoring too that a lot of people don't feel safe at home. Yeah. Right. And then that's not the best place for them. The decision to switch to a home birth should not be a decision made out of fear, mm -hmm. um, but one out of trust, like you said. And, and I think once the initial fears kind of like died down, a lot of people, that door was still open and that curiosity was still open, but they were able to make a more empowered decision about where to birth, whether it was home or hospital, depending on just what felt, what feels safest for them. Yeah. And like, we're so lucky here to have access to hospitals. So even during that to yeah. this time, so I yeah. feel like you know, being able to make that decision, knowing hey, there is a great hospital, it's not that far away from me. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think that brings a lot of security. But what a wild time to be in the line of work that you're in. I think it's super cool. Thank you. It is. Well, what a wild time also to be a mother and be pregnant and to just be raising a child and growing a child. It's I have always have so much respect and admiration for moms, but especially now just to another level. Yeah. I can't um, wait for you to be a mom. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be so cool having had the experience on the other side and then just, you know, having your own experience, like is going to be so cool. So I always tease that I, I know about the birth and then like a few weeks postpartum and then I'm like, then it's, I, I forget that they grow, you know? Yeah, totally. <laughs> they become little humans that walk and crawl and all the things. Whereas my, really my expertise only, only goes to, to so far. And then it's all new for me too. Are you in Topanga right now? Or like still? I am. And you're yeah. living like near or on a peacock farm? Is no, they're wild. Oh, they're wild. wild. Yeah. Oh my so, gosh. That's so we're, cool. Yeah. We're like living on their land. I mean, they just come pop in and sometimes they spend days like on our roof and chilling. And then sometimes we don't see them for months and then they'll come back and they had babies. <gasps> oh it was so special. They brought their little babies here. That's really cool. Up, well, yeah. How many survived or um, where they are, but they, they grow fast. That's really cool. I'm going to definitely go Google like baby peacocks after this. <laughs> They're so cute. Oh, oh, well, thank you so much for joining us, Carson. I, I love you. I appreciate all that you're doing. And I'm excited to see where, you know, your career takes you. You too. And congratulations on your new launch and all the exciting stuff you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for always supporting us. I, I really appreciate always support me. I wish I can't wait for the days we can have a big event. I know. Maybe in July, like my daughter said. Yeah, yeah. In July. Yeah. <laughs>